Okay, we're recording now. So today I'm going to go through a brief introduction to Signet. Uh, I'm going to start by giving you uh, some context of uh, what Signet is, what we do here, and then I'll go on to describe the computing clusters that we have at Signet and then how to use them. And then I'll finish by looking at data management, uh, submitting jobs on the cluster, and the various different software modules that we have available for our users. Please feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions, either in the chat or by just asking in, uh, in the audio chat. OK. So Signet is um, a center for providing a high-performance computer at the University of Toronto here. And we enable researchers to run their simulations, their analysis on a, a large parallel cluster here. But we also run uh, our services for researchers all across Canada. So, not, so it's not just for the University of Toronto. We are part of a, a larger consortia of computing clusters. Uh, there are five in total. And we are part of the, the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. That's what that's all called. Um, so there are four general purpose clusters that are all homogenous. They have the same, they have the same uh, computing nodes. So we have CEDA, which is at Simon Fraser University, Graham at the University of Waterloo, and Beluga and Narwhal uh, in Montreal. And then we have Niagara, which is based at the University of Toronto, and this is known as the, the large parallel CPU cluster. So we, we don't have any GPUs directly on Niagara, but what we also have is a separate cluster called MIST, and that hosts the, the GPU cluster. There are also several uh, cloud systems uh, across Canada if you're interested in running on those too. Okay, so we run one of the largest supercomputers in Canada, and it is comprised of a CPU cluster. So we also have the MIST GPU cluster, which is one type of GPU, which is the NVIDIA GPUs. But then we also have a smaller cluster called Rouge, and these are all available uh, to users. You just need to request access uh, from our website. You have a smaller, uh, older cluster called Teach, which if you are running your own uh, courses and you want to provide your users with a, uh, a computing environment just for the, the duration of the class, you can use our Teach cluster. We'll be happy to help with that. What we also host in our supercomputing facility is HBSS, which is a, a long-term uh, tape storage facility. So this is for data that you won't use day to day, but you might you might want to store long term. You can store it in this this tape storage. So we offer a, a few different services. So. Uh, the analysts here at Signet, we provide uh, various training courses, one of which is this intro, but we also provide scientific and parallel programming courses on various different languages. And we all have grad courses on scientific computing, data, data analysis, biostatistics in R, for example, um, and also provide courses on parallel I.O., data management, machine learning. We have a whole host of courses. And this year, well, every year, we host a Ontario HPC Summer School, which has just been announced 
uh, and starts next month. Um, and if you're interested in, in joining any of those courses, you can look at our education website linked here, and you should find all the information you need there. There is also an international summer school, HBC summer school, which we attend. We had the first in-person one last year since COVID, and the next year, this year's one is happening in the US. So that's another place you can find some, some HBC courses. So here at Signet, we are split between the software training support roles, which is where I fit in. And we also have a, a sysadmin hardware side. Um, but we, we go between the two roles. We help out in any areas we can. So we're roughly, I think, 17, 18 uh, employees. Okay, so Niagara. It's compri comprised of over 80,000 CPU cores. These are Lenovo nodes. There's roughly 2,000 of them. And each node contains 40 Intel Skylake and Cascade Lake cores, running at roughly 2.4 gigahertz. And each node, has roughly 180 uh, gigabytes of RAM. When we built the system, we ran it through the Linpack benchmark, and we obtained a 3.6 petafault performance, which got us up to uh, 59 in the top 500. I think this might need to be updated. I don't think we're, we're 150 anymore, but I, I would need to check, double check that. The, the interconnect is an Infinity Band Dragonfly Plus, which is a one to one up to 432 nodes, uh, two to one beyond that. And all of the, the data is stored in this parallel shared file system, which is comprised of home, scratch, and project space. I'll go into more detail on that later on. We also offer a burst buffer storage, which is for applications that require fast IO. And if you require some burst buffer space, please email support and we can provide you with that. So then we also have the MIST cluster, which is the the GPU cluster. This is comprised of 54 IBM Power 9 nodes. So it's interesting to note, this is a Power 9 architecture. So what you compile on this machine won't, it might compile on the, on the Niagara Skylake chips, but you'll need to use different, different compilers and software modules. So please bear in mind, you'll need to compile your code twice if you run on MIST and Niagara. Each node is hosting four GPUs and 32 Power9 cores running at 2.4 gigahertz. We have a bit more memory on this, so we have up to 256 gigabytes of RAM. So these are the, uh, the NVIDIA Volta GPUs each having 32 gigabytes of memory themselves. Again, we benchmarked this and we got up to one petaflops uh, peak performance. There's the same Dragonfly InfiniBand interconnect, and we share the same parallel file system with Niagara. So data hosted on Niagara, you can also access from MIST. Okay, so there are any questions so far before I go on to the next topic? Okay, it doesn't look like there's anything in the chat. I'll move on. Okay, 
So if you haven't already got an account for Niagara, what you'll need to do is you'll need to register on the Alliance CCTV website and get your PI to get an account first. So then they can then sponsor you uh, for free to get a Signet account. This roughly takes between one to two business days to set up. And then once you've done that, that will give you access to all of the Alliance clusters. But in order to access Niagara and MISH, you'll need to opt in to using our cluster as well. So this will create a local account on Niagara. Again, allow a day or two to set, our account, set your account up. So on, on Niagara and MIST, we have what is known as a, an SSH only login system. So this, you'll need to set up what is known as a, an, SSH, an SSH key. So you can't log in with a password on Niagara and MIST. You need to, an SSH key to authenticate. So how these keys work is they're comprised of uh, a private key. Now the private key is stored locally on your computer, the one you're connecting from. And it mustn't leave your local computer. You don't have to copy it anywhere. This is important as if this is found by someone else, they can then impersonate you and log into the system uh, as, as your account. And along with the private key, what you have is the public key. This is what you upload to the CCDB uh, database. And then this is copied to the various clusters. And this is what authenticates your access to the cluster. And I'll go on to how you set up an SSH key, but you should always protect your private key with a passphrase. There is an option to not use a passphrase when you set it up, but, but please always create, create one with a passphrase. But basically you'll create your SSH key pair on your local computer. You'll upload it to the CCDB website, and then this will be copied to the, the local servers, the local SSH servers at each Alliance cluster site. So this will be this will allow you access to the, the clusters. Yes, it's also worth pointing out that you create one SSH key pair and you can use the same SSH key pair to connect to each of the alliance cluster. You don't need to create one for each cluster. Okay. So if you if you have a Linux system, for example, you can do this, this setup, and also for Mac, I think this works. If you're using uh, Windows or Mobile Extern, for example, we have a, a separate, uh, a separate um, guide on how to use that on our website. I'll be happy to help if you just email sign it at support uh, if you have problems with that. But on a Linux system or Mac, you can use the command called SSH key gen. And this will set up your SSH key pair. So if you specify the, the type of key here, so this ED25519, and then the name, your username, uh, and your laptop is the comment, just, just to specify what that key and where it's, it's being generated or it's used for. And then the dash F flag here, it just tells you the path of where you want to save the SSH key and the name of it. So when you run this command, you will be prompted to enter your passphrase. All this passphrase does is it unlocks your key when you try to connect to the remote cluster. 
So once you've entered your passphrase, what this will do is it will generate your two keys, your private key and your private key. Your private key will not have an extension at the end, whereas the public key will just have a .bub extension and they'll both go into your .ssh form directory. Oh, we have a comment in the chat. Mark says, oh yes, yeah, you, you can use SSH key gen in a Windows PowerShell as well. Thanks, Mark. I forgot about that. So James, can I ask a question quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, what is the username at my laptop for DRA? It has to be exactly like that or so th so you have is... to use our username? So this is just uh, a comment in the SSH key file. I think that this is just the username on your local computer, so your local laptop. And then this would be the name of your laptop if your laptop has a name. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. And then I think this DRA, because that's the, the type of the key you've generated as well. Yeah. Are there any other questions before I move on? Okay. Yes, the, the dash C is just a, an optional flag to insert a comment into the key. Yeah, so you, now you've created your SSH key pair, you need to make Niagara and Miss aware of the public part of your key, not your private part, that stays on your local machine. You will sign into your Alliance account following this link here and copy and paste the public part of your SSH key uh, into the text box there and upload it. I can go over the, the CCDB menu to manage SSH keys. Now to do this, you'll just grab the, S, the public part of your SSH key, which you can just use cat and then the path to your key and just copy and paste the entirety of what comes out of that command. And then on the website, you put, you paste, you paste that in the text box here and then just give it a, a description of where the public key was generated and where you're using it from. And then add key. Now, once you add key, what should happen is the public key gets uploaded to the CCDB website and it will be propagated to each of the system aligned systems. And you will be able to SSH to them uh, once you I think you receive a, an email confirming your. Uh, your SSH key is being uploaded and it should be available uh, on each of the clusters. So when you log in to Niagara, you'll want to use SSH. You specify dash Y, which is needed to open Windows. If you're doing any, uh, if any of the software you're using is uh, GUI related. And what you'll need to do, so if you, if you generate an SSH key with a non-standard name, so if it's not one of the default names uh, provided by that SSH key gen command, you'll need to specify this dash I flag. Now this, this tells SSH where to look for your private key and which one to use to log in to Niagara. But it's good practice to, to also always use dash I uh, to specify the private key anyway. And then this is followed by the username that you've been provided on Niagara, and then niagara.signet.utoronto.ca. Then I'll ask for your SSH key passphrase. You just enter that once, and then hopefully you will uh, log in to Niagara. You should see the, the prompt change to the Niagara. Niagara login node. So this is all the same uh, for MIST, just instead of Niagara, replace this word here with MIST. 
Now, if you want to streamline your, your SSH access to Niagara, what you can do is on your local machine, you can create a, an SSH config file. Now, what this does is it just, it tells when you use the SSH command that the host Niagara has this host name, so niagara.signup.utronic.ca, and you'll be logging in with your username here, and you specify the private key file you want to use. So essentially, once you create this file, then all you have to do is SSH Niagara, and it's just much simpler and quicker than, than, than typing this all out every single time. You'll still be asked for your passphrase, um, but that uh, that makes the whole process uh, smoother. Yeah, so also it'll help with uh, data transfer commands like SAP and rsync, as they can be looking in the SSH config file for hosts, and you can just specify an agreement. To further that, if you don't want to enter your passphrase every single time you create a new session uh, on Niagara, you can use what's called an SSH agent. What this agent does is it, it holds your key, uh, holds your private key um, on your local machine. And if you enter this command, SSH add, and then the name of the private key that you want to use to log into Niagara, It'll ask you a passphrase once, and then every subsequent um, SSH Niagara commands won't ask for your passphrase. So this is during a session. So what I tend to do is I do SSH add, add the private key uh, once at the start of the day, and then every login after that, I don't need to enter the passphrase. I just do this every day uh, just to make it a bit easier to log in. Okay, to summarize, I think I went over this, but please don't share your private keys. Always use a strong passphrase when you're setting your SSH keys up. And never copy your private keys to any other systems, always keep it on your local machine. Yes, and create one key pair for each compute you, you are using to access our Alliance systems. So if you have a desktop, you'll create an SSH key, key pair for that. And then if you have a laptop, you'll create an SSH key pair for that if you're going to use both systems to connect to Niagara and NIST. So this is, so for example, if you... Um, This is if not, not quite sure. So this is if you are logging into another set of computer clusters outside of the alliance, you would create a, another SSH key pair for that just to uh, to improve security. Yes, and, and please don't create SSH key pairs on shared systems like Niagara. So once you log into Niagara, don't use the SSH key chain command. We have a, an extensive guide on SSH keys uh, here at the Alliance site, if you want to uh, read on this topic further. Oh yeah, also the first time you'll SSH to Niagara, you'll get this, this prompt here. And all this is doing is, is checking the, the, the host key fingerprint. That just matches what Niagara is. So sometimes you can you can run into what's known as a, a man in the middle attack. So they can uh, they can pretend to to be Niagara. But if you look at the the SSH key fingerprint, and we have this on the on the wiki, if these don't match, then let us know and don't connect to Niagara because it, it could be a session to somewhere else that you don't know about. But generally this these should match and then you just you just type yes and you you log into Niagara and you wouldn't you won't have to do it on subsequent 
uh, login attempts. Okay, so are there any questions about SSH keys and how to log into Niagara before I move on? Okay, so once you're logged in, we have three types of nodes on Niagara. We have the login nodes, which are where you will directly go to on your SSH to the system. This is where you will compile your code, develop it, edit it, prepare and submit jobs. They have the same architecture as the, the compute nodes and the same software stack. And bear in mind that the login nodes are shared uh, via multiple users. So please don't run any intensive jobs or applications on the login nodes, please submit via the, the scheduler and run on the compute nodes. As you'll notice, you don't want to slow the, the system down for other users. So yeah, that brings us to the compute nodes. So in order to run on the compute nodes, what you need to do is you need to submit a batch job. Now what this does is you'll, you'll create a job script which will specify how many nodes you want to run on for roughly how long you think your, your job will take. And then we'll specify the, the modules, the, the libraries that your, your job will need. And then you'll submit this to the what's known as the Slurm scheduler. And this will schedule your job and your job will run on the compute nodes in the future at some some predetermined time. Along with the login and compute nodes, we also have the, the data mover nodes. Uh, these are used for large data transfers. So what can happen if you have a large file to transfer, your internet connection might be, um, might not remain up for the, the, the duration of the transfer which can, can have uh, data transfer. So what you'll use is the, the data mover nodes, and these will be able to transfer your data uh, more effectively than just using the login nodes. But they're all on the, the same shared file system. Uh, so you'll be able to access your data from anywhere in the system. So that brings us on to the various directories on Niagara. So when you log in, you'll be placed into your, your home directory. This directory is where you'll either develop your code, as I said, compile it, uh, and it has a, a handy environment variable. So if you just do dollar home, this is a, um, a shortcut to getting back to your home directory. And then what we also have is the, the scratch directory. So what you'll do is you'll you'll run your jobs from the, the scratch directory and all outputs from your simulations will be stored in scratch, which I'll get onto later of why we want all the data in scratch uh, as opposed to home. But please try and use these, these environment variables and make sure life a bit easier. We also have project. So you'll automatically be assigned uh, storage on home and scratch, but depending on your rack allocation, you might have also project directory, which is again, just the same uh, with a different environment variable to access your space there. And then I mentioned earlier about the burst buffer. So this is, for applications with heavy I.O. needs. Uh, this will give you uh, a, a faster parallel file system on the first buffer. Okay. So this, this table describes each of the different directories on Niagara. So we have home. But bear in mind, 
the quota on home is only 100 gigabytes. So you won't be storing a large amount of data on home. And it only has a limit of 250,000 files. But also to point out, everything in home, in your home directory, is backed up. So this is backed up daily. Uh, and so for example, if you accidentally delete a file in your home directory one day and you created it, I don't know, a couple of days before, you'll be able to ask us for a the, the copy of the file from since the last backup. So it'll be from the day before. So we'll be able to retrieve your file. Now, access to home from the compute nodes is only read only. So when you submit your jobs to the scheduler, when it writes output files, it won't be able to write to home. You'll only be able to write to all of, to, to Scratch, for example, a project. So always bear that in mind when you're submitting your jobs uh, via the scheduler that it's it's read only on on home. So that brings us to Scratch. On Scratch, you have a much bigger uh, quota. You have up to to 25 terabytes and six million files. However, on Scratch, we have a an expiration policy of two months. So if the file hasn't been touched for two months. So if you haven't opened or accessed the file for two months, it gets purged. But we'll send out a, a monthly reminder for this purging policy and it'll let users know uh, which files are staged for a purging. So which files are going to be deleted. And in order to prevent them from being deleted, you'll either touch the files so you'll update their, their access to more recent value and then they won't get deleted. But that's that's also worth bearing in mind when you store files in Scratch. Ideally, Scratch is there for output of simulations and the data that you want to keep long-term, you'll move from Scratch into either project or uh, archive, which I'll go on to a bit later for a longer term uh, storage solution. Yeah, so remember that the home is backed up daily, Scratch is not. So any files that you delete on Scratch, we won't be able to retrieve them if they were deleted by accident, for example. So just please bear that in mind. And they are also right, they're able to be written to by compute nodes. So when you set up your jobs, please write to Scratch. A project, again, the amount of quarters depending on your back allocation, as uh, same as with the number of files. So, so project is also backed up the same way as home. So yeah, please bear that, that in mind. Uh, and it's also accessible by the computer, which you can write to. The first buffer, on the other hand, has a, it's by request. So ask, ask us if you want first buffer space. And expiration, we're not enforcing this strictly yet, but please keep your first buffer directories clean. Uh, and yeah, they are also not backed up first buffer. And they're accessible by compute mode. So archive space is the, the HPSS tape storage that I mentioned earlier. This is also this is also also backed up. But again, this is depending on your your group allocation and how much space you have in archive. So this is for long-term data. Yeah, this is an, an interesting point is the compute nodes, we don't have any local storage on the compute nodes. We just have memory. If your application is not using a lot of memory, then what you can use is what's called the RAM, the RAM disk or a local disk on the compute nodes to store something for the duration of the job and then copy it to, uh, to Scratch or, or Project, for example. 
after the job's finished. So this might give you a, a better performance instead of writing directly back to scratch throughout the job. Yeah, so archive is either Neoline or HPSS storage. You need to access it uh, via a special node, so it's not mounted on the login or the computer. But there's there's uh, there's documentation on how to do that on our on our wiki. Yeah, so that, as I said, backups uh, a recent snapshot. So it's either from the day before. So it's not an archive data of each each version, each change you made to the file for the entire history of it. Okay, so if you're moving data to Niagara, you'll want to use either the, the SCP or the RSYN commands if you're using Linux, for example. Um, if you specify your private key with the, the dash I flag, the same way as we use SSH, just use this syntax. So this file and just copy it to Niagara to sign it. And then that is the path that you want to copy it to on Niagara. If you've created an SSH config file, you wouldn't need to put your private key here. And I, I think you, you don't even need to specify your username, you just specify Niagara, colon, colon, and then the path to where you want to copy your file to. I think our thing's a, a bit different syntax. You specify dash E to specify a private key. However, yeah, so this is what I mentioned. Uh, this will time out for amounts larger than 10 gigabytes. So in order to use the order to transfer data larger than that, you'll need to use the data mover nodes. So these are the addresses to the data mover nodes. So when you SSH, you just specify this address as well instead. If you're copying data quite often, we have a an online uh, GUI interface called Globus. So this is a web-based tool for data transfer. Uh, it'll be much and will be much easier to transfer data if you do it more often. So to copy data to HPSS, you'll need to create a, a Slurm job or use Globus. We have, I'm not going to go through how to do that uh, in this talk, but if you look on our wiki, we have various uh, documentation on how to do that. Okay, so there are any questions about storage, about home, scratch, project? Okay, I think I'll move on. So once we've logged into Niagara, we want to develop our code, compile it. You'll need access to the software libraries. Now on Niagara, we use what's called uh, the module system. You'll use module load to load, uh, for example, a C compiler, Fortran compiler, or Python, or an R software stack to to set them up in your environment what it allows you to do is you can install multiple different versions of software on a given system without them conflicting with each other if you do a module spider command it'll show you all of the software available on our system so we just run that here i'll show you have so we have two different stacks on Niagara, we have the CC stack, which is used on all of the Alliance clusters, where you have a, a Naya N stack, which is a specialized to the Niagara cluster itself. It's optimized for, for running on our uh, Intel Skylake chips. So you'll all, always load either one of these first. I think it defaults to the Naya end 2019B currently, but you can then change to the CC stack afterwards just by loading this module. Oh, 
getting a bit ahead of myself. So if you know the software module name, you'll just use a module load to get that into your environment. Module purge will remove all of the loaded modules. And again, as we saw, module spider lists all the available software packages. A module list will list all of the modules that you currently have loaded. I have already mentioned this. We have two different software stacks on Niagara. Yes, yeah, so you'll need uh, CC, CCNV and standard env if you're moving to the BCC stack. Yeah, and this is a little bit different. We just have one system specific stack because it's a, a Power9 architecture versus the, the Intel chips that we have on Niagara. But you can access CUDA, PGI, Excel uh, from that stack. Okay, so let's say we want to load the OpenMPI module. We type this in, uh, but it throws an error because you will need to load um, prerequisite modules before loading on OpenMPI. So as it says, let's run module spider OpenMPI, and it'll give you a list of all the different versions of OpenMPI that we have installed in the system. And once you run a module spider on a specific version, it'll give you which compiler modules you'll need to run to, to load before loading the open API module like we want. So here you'll just load, you'll just pick this Intel module, this 29 update four before loading the open API module. And as you can see, we're loading, we're using the, the Naya end stack and we have the Intel compiler loaded along with the open MPI library. So some tips for modules. Yeah, we, we highly advise against load modules in your bash RC. This can load, lead to very confusing behavior when you're trying to load a different module, but you already have your main modules loaded from your bash RC automatically. So that's those modules will get loaded automatically if you include them in your bash RC. So what we recommend is creating a separate script from your bash RC and name it uh, load underscore modules.sh and add the modules that you need in there and source them only once you've logged into Niagara rather than put them directly in your bash RC script. Uh, yeah, so when you create, which I'll, I'll go on to later, your submission scripts, you need to include the modules that you, you loaded to build your code in your submission script, just so they match up when they come to run on the compute modes. And if you just specify a module without the version, it will default to a, a specific version on the system. But it's usually better to be explicit about the versions you use just for uh, future reproducibility. So we have some commercial software on Niagara, but generally you have to bring your own license um, to use it on Niagara. So we have uh, licenses for for Intel, IBM, and Parallel Debuggers, for example, but we we don't have licenses for MATLAB, Gaussian IDL. We have some open source alternatives like Octave, Python, and R. But we are, we're happy to help install commercial software for you if, if you have a license uh, to bring with you. Yeah, there are also um, more software available in the Alliance stack, which is the, the CC stack, which I mentioned earlier. It's confusing because, so the Alliance, the Digital Alliance Research uh, of Canada used to be called the Compute Canada. So that's why I keep referring to, to the CC stack, which is the same as the Alliance stack. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. 
So if you want to use Python, we have uh, various different versions available and they come in the, with the module load command. And we also already have them optimized with NumPy and SciPy already pre-installed. So if you want to install further Python packages, we recommend that you set up your own virtual environment. So to do this, you'll load a specific Python version and use virtual n. And then when you specify the system side packages, you'll also get NumPy and any other standard packages that we've installed in the system. And this will create a virtual environment. You'll just activate this environment and then you can do pip install. And this will save all of the, the Python packages to your home directory. If you want to use this in the Python environment in the, the Jupyter Hub that we also have available um, in Signet, you can use this uh, venv to Jupyter uh, script to convert the virtual environment to uh, a Jupyter Hub compatible uh, setup. Yeah, please. If at all possible, don't use Condor environments because they create a large number of files which hampers the performance of the parallel file system. So if you, if you can, please use the, the virtual environment set up with Python. So we have uh, various R version, uh, versions available as modules. Just please load the, the GCC module first and you'll be able to check with the, mo the module are uh, available, uh, all of the different ones we have uh, available. Now, once you've loaded R, you can install packages again into your, your local home directory using this install.packages command. Yeah, so the first time you do this, it'll ask if you want to install on in your home directory and just say yes. Okay, so let's, let's say you want to compile your application on Niagara with either a C, C++ or Fortran compiler. So we have both types. So we have an Intel and GNU compilers available as modules. The same goes for MPI libraries. We have OpenMPI available and MPI. Intel MPI available. But for the best performance, if you use an open MPI, is to use the, the Intel compilers in, in tandem with the open MPI modules. Now, when you compile for Niagara, the best, the best optimization, best performance you're going to get is if you use this mArch native flag for GCC. So this will compile your code to make use of the best instructions on the, the Intel Skylake chips or xhost flag uh, if you compile them with an Intel compiler. So this is just a, a brief example. I want to compile with the Intel compiler and I'm going to use GSL uh, library, load the modules. We have the main here, just use the ICC compiler. I want to compile with O3, which is a highest optimization level and with Xhost, we'll compile specifically for the, the Intel Skylake chips and specify the names of the the object files that will generate. And then once you've generate your object files for both the main and the module, you'll link in, you'll link those both together, and then you'll link in the GSL library along with the, the MKL library, which comes as a part of the, the Intel software stack. Are there any questions so far?
Okay. Do the time. Okay. Okay, so if you want to test your code before, before running on the compute nodes, you can run small test jobs on the logger nodes, but it, as, a, as a rule of thumb, if it just takes a couple of minutes to run and you're only using a few gigabytes of memory, that's fine. But if it's anything longer than that, 30 minutes an hour, uses a lot of memory, please submit to the compute nodes. Uh, and what we also have is the, the DDT debugger is a module as well. And this comes with the, the map profiler as well, if you want to profile your code. So say, for example, you want to run something just as a test, but it doesn't fit on the login. Or so you run more than a couple of gigabytes of memory uh, for a longer than a couple of minutes. What we have is a, a dedicated, dedicated debug node on Niagara, which just acts as a, a compute node. And you, you can request access to it with the, the debug job command. And you specify the number of nodes that you would like. You can ask for up to four nodes. And if you ask for four nodes, you'll only have the four nodes for 15 minutes. If you ask for two nodes, you'll have the two nodes for 30 minutes and one node you can have for up to an hour. You cannot, and what this will do is it'll create an interactive session on the, the debug node. So you'll be able to run directly without having to um, submit a job to the scheduler. The same goes for MIST, where you just specify the number of GPUs you want to request. Okay, so how to submit jobs to compute nodes? So we use the Slurm job scheduler. Uh, how you submit to the scheduler is use the, the sbatch command, uh, followed by the name of your job script. I'll, talk, I'll tell you what the job script needs to contain in the next slide. But what this does is it places your job in the queue and then it'll run on the compute nodes in due course, depending on how many nodes you've asked for and how long you think your job is going to take. So if you ask for 100 nodes for 20 hours, it's going to take a long time to run on the computer. Let's all wait in the queue before you have the priority to run. So you'll either run under your, your rack allocation or under a default allocation, depending on the group that you, you're under. Yeah, so the scheduling works is you always get access to the full node. So if you ask for one node, you'll also you'll also get access to the full 40 cores on the new on the node. So please try and use all of the cores because otherwise it's just waste, wasted uh, CPU cycles. So please try and maximize the the workload that you submit to the queue. On missed. Yeah, you schedule by either single GPU or up to a multiple of four nodes. Sorry, up to a multiple of four GPUs. Again, please use all the GPUs. We have a hard limit of 24 hours for each job. This is to uh, make it easier to schedule jobs. Uh, and what you can do is if you're if you want to run longer than 24 hours uh, and your code uh, has a, a checkpoint in facility, what you can do is you can run 24 hours and your code will checkpoint, or create a, a checkpoint file or a restart file, and then you'll submit a job again, and it'll read that restart file and it'll continue where it left off from the previous job. As I went through earlier, jobs should write to your scratch. A project directory is home is, is read only on the compute node. And also the compute nodes have no internet access. You shouldn't be downloading files on the compute nodes anyway. Uh, please do all of that on the on the login nodes. 
So this is an example of a, a submission script just to run a lot of serial jobs. Yeah, so this just indicates it's a, it's a bash script. Yeah, and all of these lines here with which start with test batch are read by the slowdown schedule itself. So what you're telling here is you want one node and you want to run uh, 40 tasks per node. So you want a task per core on the node. And then you're giving it roughly how long you think the job will take to run the completion. Bear in mind, if your job runs longer than three hours, it will get canceled because you specified the maximum limit that you, your job can take. You can give your job a name, just so you know, when you look in the queue, you can see what job is which. And then you can specify the, the output, the text output of your job and give that a name. And then what this percentage J does here is this is interpreted by Slurm and it'll take your, so every time you submit a job, you'll get a job ID. And this job ID will be appended to your file name here. And then this file flag here, this mail type equals fail. What it'll do is if your job fails, it'll send you an email letting you know that your job has failed. Then what you'll have to do is you'll load all of the modules that you use to create your application that you're going to run, just so the compute nodes have the same software environment as what you had on the, the login nodes. So this is running a, a serial job, but you're running it with parallel. So it'll run uh, 100 different instances of your job uh, or, or run 40 at the same time for, for the cause, for 40 cores, and then it'll, it'll, it'll go back around again and as each job finishes from the next job on the same, on the same call. So you'll activate your Python environment and then call this parallel Python application. Yeah, so when you submit the job, please submit it from scratch as again, homes read only when you're running your jobs. When you submit it, it'll wait in the queue until it finds a node that is available for your job to run. Then it'll load the modules, activate the Python environments, and then execute your job. Yeah, we have uh, a lot of uh, examples on how to run different jobs on Niagara on our wiki. I have uh, somebody raised their hand. Is it Maurice? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind okay. me asking a question, uh, yeah. what happens if, say, we're running a Python file, we're using the multi processing module in Python? Is right. the node smart enough to make use of 40 cores uh, or how many ever we need uh, if we just call it from Python, from within Python? Yeah, instead yeah of it, using... sh it should be able to do that. Yeah. This, this okay. example is just to show that if you had a, a serial script, this is a way to run it in parallel, like without using the multi process from within Python, if, if you see what I'm saying. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so then this next example is if you're running a, a parallel application using OpenMP. We have the same syntax here, asking for one node, but now you're asking for uh, either CPUs per task rather than tasks per node. So then each, each core is available for OpenMP to run. You load your modules, you can export OMP num threads, which lets OpenMP know how many calls are available to run threads on. This Slurm CPUs per tasks is a Slurm environment variable, which is pulled from this, this part of the script here. So this 
this will evaluate to 40. And then when you run your OpenMP example, it should run on every single port on the node. Yes, it's it's pretty much the same as the, as the previous example. MPI is, is slightly different. This is when you want to run across multiple nodes, not just on a single node. You so you press two nodes here, and then this end tasks for no notice. This stays the same as in the the first example. So this will specify forty MPI tasks to run on each node. So in total, you'll have eighty tasks running, but you'll have forty on each node. This is the way Slurm will place the tasks uh, when the job runs. So you'll load the modules, the Intel compiler, and your MPI library, and you'll use MPI run to run your application. And this should spawn the MPI ranks on each of the nodes, so 40 in each node. So once you've submitted your job, you can monitor the status of it using the, the SQ command. This will show all of the jobs in the queue for, for you. If you specify dash dash me. Uh, and then you can ask for specific information for, for each job. If you just specify the job ID, remember this, this is returned when you use, you call the sbatch command. It'll give you a job ID. There's various different commands you can use, like S control will do a similar, a similar thing. If you want an, a rough, a very rough estimate of when your job will start, use this dash dash start followed by your job ID, and Slow will give you an estimate on when it thinks your job will run. Now, if you want to get a performance view of your job whilst it's running. You can use the job perf command followed by the job ID, and this will show you the CPU usage along with the, the memory usage uh, on, on, the, on the compute nodes. If you want to cancel your job, if, if you think it's either hanging or you've made a mistake, you can just use an S cancel. So that's on a per per job basis. If you want to cancel all the jobs that you're running, you can specify the dash u command followed by your, your username. But be careful, this, this will cancel all jobs in the queue for you, like from your user account. If you want to see if there are any, any available compute nodes, you can use this sinfo command. And that gives you a sense of how how full the system is, how many compute nodes are being used at any one time. And then the S account command gives you information on recent jobs you ran, how long they ran for, how many nodes, cores, memory, footprint that you used. We have full documentation on Slurm on our wiki. Okay, are there any further questions? Instead of using the, the Slurm commands here to monitor your jobs, what we also have is a web-based interface called MySignet, which is which I find very useful. It shows you currently running jobs, uh, previously run jobs, and I'll give you a, a brief overview of what, what the load is on the system and how much Scratch project space is available. It'll show the status of the login nodes. So if, if somebody's running a, a job on the login node, you'll be able to tell on the My Sign It page. You'll be able to see how much memory is being used. And this is for both Niagara and NIST. And it shows jobs uh, at a frequency of every 10 minutes. So it'll log the, the metrics from the job every 10 minutes. 
so if you've if you've run a job and it fails within the first 10 minutes, you won't get any uh, any metrics available. But there's a whole host of uh, useful information. So memory usage, CPU usage, uh, gigaflop use, uh, gigaflop performance, uh, disk I/O. But here's, a, here's an example. Um, you can you can log in with your your Sinai account. Uh, you can go to you can go to either either jobs and you can specify the job ID, or you can go to users and find your username, and it'll show you all all the jobs that you've run or are running. So as you can see, it shows you that this this particular job is running. Uh, what partitions are running on and how many nodes it's using uh, and the start time of the job and how, what the, the time you've set on the job but what's more useful is is these graphs that it produces so you can see the, the cpu usage over time but note that it it only updates every every 10 minutes you'll get a data point and this will show per Per node. So this is running on two nodes, so each color is a different node. I'll show you the, the script I used to submit the job. Uh, just so you can see exactly what you used. But yeah, I'd, I'd highly recommend you uh, try my sign out to mark your jobs. So there's a technology. Uh, Called hyperthread. So what hyperthread does is it. So on on a compute node you have forty physical cores. Um, but with hyperthread enabled, which we do have on Niagara, we get eighty cores because each each physical core has an associated logical core. What it's called. So you can potentially run two threads per core, which results in up to eighty. 80 cores. Um, what I would recommend you do if you have a if you have your parallel application, sometimes it benefits from running on say 80, 80 threads per node, 80 cores. But sometimes the performance is not is not better than just running on the 40 physical cores rather than using these, these logical cores extra. Uh, on MIST, uh, it's the same, but it's just each physical core has a full virtual cores, so you can have up to 120 cores on on this. But I would uh, I'd recommend you try it out just see if you get a better performance than running on uh, the 40 physical cores on the compute nodes. Now you can do this if you set the number of tasks per node. So you'll set the number of nodes. And then you'll set the number of tasks per node. So if you set this to, to 80, then you'll get 80 tasks per node. And this will be using the, the height of threads. Uh, MPI run and S run should automatically distribute the tasks uh, correctly after you specify that. But remember when you use the height of threads, if you specify the 80 threads, you'll only be billed for 40 of them because the billing only works for the 40 physical calls uh, on the node. Okay, so for the last topic, I'm gonna to go through uh, data management and IO. Are there any questions so far before I, I go to the last topic? Okay. Yeah, so all of your data, all your files can be seen from the login nodes and compute nodes, but remember only certain directories are writable from the compute node, the compute nodes. The home scratch and project are all part of what's called a parallel file system, which is called GPFS. This is a high performance uh, file system, which provides uh, rapid reads and writes to large 
large data sets from many nodes. But what can degrade the performance of GPFS is if it has to use, has to write to read from uh, lots of small files. So what we recommend if you can do when you're writing your output files, if you can write fewer large files as opposed to a large number of small files, because this improves the performance of GPFS of a parallel file system. And it also it takes up more space on the on the system, on the parallel file system as well. If you have lots of small files versus a few large files. If you can, you can write out and write your data out in binary. It's faster and it, yeah, it takes up less space on the on the file system. If you want to have access to the burst buffer for IO heavy applications, the speed up your checkpoints, you can just email us at, at support at Synet, and we'll we'll give you a, a temporary access to the, the burst buffer the burst buffer directory. I think that uh, is it. If if you want to read up on this further, we have uh, our website. We have the Niagara Quick Start Guide, which I uh, highly recommend you read at least. Uh, the same for MIST. And there are various other uh, documentation on each of the Alliance clusters on the Alliance website. You can check our, our system status page here. So if you, for example, if you're trying to log into Niagara and it's failing, you can check to see if there's any uh, any maintenance happening in Niagara. Uh, it will show on this page here. And we also have the, the education site for uh, further future courses that you want to attend. I think that ends it. If if you have any other questions, please email us at support or at the, the Alliance here. Uh, and I think that's it. So thanks for your attention. If, if there are any questions, please, please let me know.